Welcome to today's webinar with Dr. Darren Martin. Boy, it seems like a long time since I've seen all of you, and I'm really excited to be hosting today's webinar. We have a fabulous guest, so you'll want to stay tuned through the entire program. I'm Joan Burge. I'm founder and CEO of Office Dynamics International. We are a global leader in the development and presentation of sophisticated training programs and information for administrative professionals. And we have been doing this since 1990. I'm also the author of four books for assistance, and one of our books is an Amazon bestseller, Who Took My Pen Again? Well, I am very excited, as I said, about having um, Dr. Martin. By the way, I need to ask Darren. I call you Darren all the time. Am I supposed to be referring to you as Dr. <laughs> Martin <laughs> or Dr. D? But um, Darren participated in a webinar with us last year. And it was around his book, A Company of Owners. It was very well received. We had a wonderful time on that webinar with Darren and we learned a lot. Darren was also a speaker at our conference last year for administrative excellence here in Las Vegas. He was a big hit. So we just had to bring him back. And also very exciting, he has a new book. Um, I think actually he has a couple new books here. And today we're going to be focusing on the one book, The Beached Whale. Before I begin the program, I have a few logistics to go over with you. And as you are coming into the chat, yes, please say hello to each other. Let us know where you are from. So as far as our announcements, the learning part of the session will be about 40 minutes and then we will have Q&A with Darren. So please, please, please be sure to stay on. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar in the chat. And I believe there's even a little icon that you can select that has a question mark so that this way we will quickly know that you have a question. Uh, the Webinar Jam chat holds a thousand people. So if you don't get on, it's because you weren't the first thousand. <laughs> and next time you might want to come sooner and join us. Also, if you have any technical issues, which does happen, and a lot of times it's really at uh, your end of it. But if you do have any issues, please use the chat. That is the only place we can really help you. And I would greatly appreciate uh, if you would not send Malia emails about it because she actually can't do anything, you know, at that point through an email. So the chat is the best place to go. We do not have a handout for today. Just be sure to take great notes. And my last announcement is we will be sending a replay link to you. So if you should miss anything, um, we are going to. Um, send you so, an email afterward. And am I back on? I'm on. Play link. You are <laughs> on. I can hear you. I hear you, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the phone now. Okay. All right. Hello? Yep. All right. We are just checking. Sorry, we Jen, have... we're just having a little bit of technical issue. Can you hold on for just a second? Yes, I can. Okay, Darren. Yeah. She's not talking. Has the webinar yeah, started? No, I can't. There's no audio. Okay. Mm, Darren does not have audio, so I'm going to get his call right now over to you, Joan. All right. Thank you, Malia. You'll come on in here and we'll do that. Yes. All right. So I'm not sure what's going on. You know, I've got, it's Im always I've got fun. image. So if we want to just uh, turn the. Hello, come on in, everyone. Yeah, I've got image, and I can see her talking. I just can't hear her. So if, if you want to put her over the phone. Okay, we could do that, Darren. Let's see, Darren, can you hear me? I can, I can hear, hear you over the phone. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. I can even hear you on um, through the computer, but I also hear you on the phone. So if we're good, you can hear me okay? I can, I can hear you okay. Okay. All right. Well, viewers, I know all of you being the wonderful administrative I, professionals you are, you know technical difficulties happen. 
So, um, hey, Joan, I just lost you off of the phone. Oh, I don't know what's happening to us today, Darren. I don't know. Hey, Joan, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Okay. Maybe I, I can lip read the whole you. thing. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's but get... do you want me to try to relaunch this and see if we can get it back up no i could see you fine can you vamp I... for a little bit just give me a thumbs up if you want me to relaunch and see if i can get the sound back um no <laughs> okay never mind call, call if y'all want to call me on the phone okay gotcha all right you are seeing troubleshooting in action Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, as assistants, you're always having to deal with this. So um, I'm going to try to get Darren on the telephone. Are you there, Darren? Yeah. Actually, can you hear me over the computer right now? Are you getting any feedback? No. Okay. Let's just go with that. Good. Forget the phone. We're good. Yeah? Yep. Okay. All right. Then let's get going because I don't want anything else to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about the benefits of technology during oh this. This is not a good God. day to do that, it's right, Joan? Crazy, <laughs> right? Absolutely crazy. Well, Darren is going to be speaking at this year's conference, and our theme is the accelerated assistant. And as we all know, everything is constantly accelerating. Um, and so I thought Darren's book tied in beautifully with our theme this year, his new book. So Darren, let's jump right in. And how did you come up with this book idea? As usual, you always have great titles that, you know, catch my attention. Yeah, it's actually the worst title ever because people have misunderstood it on so many different levels. But I, the, the book was born out of my uh, experience being in and out of Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 500 companies, even some mom and pops. It really doesn't matter the size of the company. Mm -hmm. And just seeing companies that many of them legacy, they've been around 30, 40 years. They have, you know, thousands of employees, lots of money, and yet they're sitting on a sand dune. They're just kind of stuck. And I think a lot of our, a lot of people find themselves that way that, um, you know, we miss the memo, as I say, that the world as we know it is over and that they, we're just stuck in this, you know, where do we go? What's everything is changing at such a dizzying pace. So I really the, the book is is called Unbeached, but it's uh, or beached. But it's really about unbeaching. It's about how do you, as I say, learn to swim in the new ocean and develop new habits, new patterns, both as a company, but for our purposes today and for, and, and for the conference more individually? How do you get out of some of those stuck places so that you can really thrive in today's environment? Yes. Thank you. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yes. At first I was like, what is this book about? And then, <laughs> I mean, as soon as I read it, I'm like, I get it right away. And as you could see, and everyone out there, I flagged lots of pages. And what I did is I selected particular chapters and topics that I thought were very appropriate for our administrative audience. And so that's what we're going to touch on today. I'm going to go through eight uh, different topics or points that I loved in the book, and then Darren's going to expand on them. So on um, the first one, is that good? Are we good? Yeah, that's fantastic. I, yeah, I love it. All right. So the first uh, one that I had flagged that had to do, it actually was called Accelerate. And then you also said, and eliminate anything that creates unnecessary work. Joan, how much of people's day is spent just on wasted activity? In fact, I saw a statistic recently. I was doing a big thing for uh, a company on, uh, it was called Successful People Take Vacation. The average person leaves oh, wow. nine, va nine vacation days on the calendar every year that the average person worker uses. But when I was doing this uh, research for that, it, it you know I found a stat that said people spend at a at a typical company people spend fifty percent of their time organizing information, not doing anything with it, but just organizing it. So think about how much of your day is spent checking email, filing stuff, putting things away sending this over here, making sure this gets, you know, and it's just a ridiculous amount. Uh, boy, I'm sure the, you know, the, the, the people that are chiming in here now, 
can relate to this. How much of our time is spent in meetings? Mm -hmm. 80% of the meetings of which are just, you know, there's no real value add. There's no clear, you know, strategy or action that comes out of those. So there's just a lot of wasted time in the workplace. And, um, you know, this is the, t today's world is about acceleration. Mm -hmm. And people think that means, oh, go faster. I can't go any faster. But I think it's a combination of going faster, smarter. So it used to be said that in the in the old world, it was, uh, it, was the, it was the big fish that ate the little fish. They say now that it's the, the fast fish that eat the slow fish. Mm. And I think that that's true. I, you know, I'm not trying to stress people out with you need to move quicker because really what needs to happen is you need to, you know, every, the, the, the people listening to this are, you know, rock stars. They, they are performers. They wouldn't be chiming into something like this. I mean, the people that, that, that tune into this, that attend the conference, you've already vetted out your high performers. Okay. Because the low performers just, they, they have no interest in anything like this. So we're talking to high performers already. The, the speed bumps are what's slowing them down. So I don't care how fast that Ferrari is. If it's going down a, a, a road with two foot speed bumps every 50 yards, it can only accelerate to a certain level. And so I think we need to look for everything in our work day that is a speed bump, that is as a, a, a pace car, as I call it, something that's mm -hmm. getting nasty. Anything that just slows down what our normal performance ca capabilities are. And everybody watching this can make their own mental list of these are the things that get in my way that really uh, limit my ability to perform. You got to eliminate those. Yeah, I love that idea. I just wrote myself a note to look for the speed bumps. I think that's excellent. Um, and, and for assistants, um, because they are always so busy trying to meet the demands, you know, of everyone else and the expectations and the deadlines that are given to them, that they they truly do move at a very fast pace. And I love your idea of maybe sometimes we're so busy looking um, as to what we have to get done today and the deadline date, we're not actually looking for the speed bumps. <laughs> Right. Right. So maybe it's we need to bring a, a level of consciousness to pay attention to what might be our speed bumps. I mean, what do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. Because how many uh, of the assistants that are watching this can relate to this? 80% of your time is spent on 20% of the people. And typically, these are some high demand folks who. Uh, you have to do things for that either a they could do for themselves. They could do through technology if they followed the process or the system. And so I know that's a sticky point, but sometimes just educating people to be able to do things uh, in a much more efficient manner, uh, you, you know, could could go a long way. I, um, I remember I went to work for a company and I kept calling the, the front desk and she was giving me, you know, connecting me with uh, with extensions. And finally, she said, Darren, look. Here's an extension sheet. Let me show you how this works. And she saved herself a whole lot of time just because she took the time to sit down and educate me. So that's on a real simple level. But there's some other things just in terms of uh, we get in that mode of there's a technological solution that would make things easier. Or if we were to, you know, it, picture in the day uh, someone using a 10 key. They're so busy using the 10 key that they don't have time to learn how to use Excel. Well, if they took the week to learn how to use Excel, then it would save them time from then on, right? Yeah. So what are those things that we could eliminate or do or change or educate other people to uh, do in a different way so that we really, really could get uh, get the more important stuff done? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the second uh, idea I highlighted that I think is so important um, and again, feeling like maybe assistants struggle with having the time, or I should say making the time to do this. You have evaluate your outcomes and progress made. So what was that about, if you can um, expand on that? So the old work structure was geared largely around hours spent. People would brag about things like, well, I'm working 70 hours this week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the most common response, somebody says, I'm going on vacation. In that kind of work culture, the response is, well, I wish I could do that, right? Because there's, oh, right. there's this pride. It's a badge we wear of how many hours we work. 
I tell people, I don't care how much, how many hours you work. I pay for outcomes, not activity. Mm -hmm. So when I'm hiring people to help me in my business or do things, that's what I tell them. I said, look, you could spend 80 hours a week on, you know, promoting me or working on my account, but if it didn't produce any results, then it's, it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. I do say, I, I, I think I say this in the book that we need more lazy people because I'm convinced that lazy people are the ones that came up with the wheel, with Excel, with fire, you know, all of these different inventions down through history, because somebody said, I'm really tired of carrying this bucket of water from the, from the river back to the village. What if we hooked up this <laughs> series of bamboo where we could run it to the, you know, I, I, and take this a little tongue in cheek is how it's intended, but I really think a lot of times it's the lazy people. Unfortunately, um, many folks that are high performers are just hard workers as well. And so they will just churn, 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 churn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we got to sit back and go, whoa, hold on. I, I need to evaluate what kind of results I'm able to produce. And if I'm not producing results or if I'm not making progress, I need to reevaluate the whole thing and consider all of this, quote, busy work, you know, mm -hmm. that is happening. And here's a, by the way, Joan, here's a good way to know whether you're producing results or not. It's how okay. you feel at the end of the day. Oh, okay. Because when I just do busy work all day and just, you know, respond to this and do that and do all this. I feel exhausted at the end of the day. When I actually produce something, I make something, I create something, I move the bar forward. You know, I make some real legitimate progress. I come up with a new tool. That's when I feel fulfilled because that's really who we're hardwired to be. We're not hardwired to be machines just churning out, you know, uh, uh, work. We're meant to be producers who are really creating. That's really great. And I love that because, um, for years, I've talked to assistants in terms of you're not a task doer and order taker. Um, you know, you're so much more than that. And you're this cognitive being and also, you know, interesting with the the outcomes, because especially for assistants, they're really used to their task list. Um, but something else I just thought of as you were talking uh, the last few years as I've worked with assistants on building a career portfolio and such, and we get into talking about resumes a little bit. And one thing that I know I've brought up the last few years is don't list your tasks on your resume. You know, the meeting planning, the travel planning. Yeah, we know that. What's the outcome of what you did? I want to see the outcome. So I ensured flawless, a flawless trip for my executive. That's the outcome. Um, right, Joan, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I know exactly what you're so, saying. We are so together on that. So here's a good assistant. A good assistant is I took that list of the things that you gave me, and I went and did those things, and I did them with great results. Here they are. Right. Here's a off the chart, invaluable, make yourself indispensable to any organization assistant. I took that list of things that you gave me. And I recognize some patterns of that we've done this three months in a row and what we're trying to go for here. And I've actually come up with some ways to either automate the system or get better results or uh, to eliminate this activity altogether so that it can, you know, you can get the same result you're looking for with this other approach. And I've got two or three suggestions here that I want to give you and let's take a look at them and see if they meet the need. Now, man, that's real value, right? Right. Uh, when we're just doing what somebody else is saying, hey, go do these seven things, I think we're limiting ourselves. And that's why so so many people, maybe even listening to this, are, are just kind of frustrated with their work because they're not getting to turn on their, their, their best element. They're not getting yeah. to do what they got to this job to do in the first place, which is be a problem solver, be a thinker. And I know there's going to be a backlash and some people are going to say, no, my boss doesn't want that. He doesn't want that might be a boss problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your boss right. doesn't want you coming up with quicker, better, faster solutions, more efficient. Just do what I told you. That's, that's a whole different webinar. But for the most part, I think that's where you provide most value. That's, that's a good one. That may have to be a webinar someday. Um, because, uh, you know, I do see that people will come to my workshops and they're all, they're excited, they're pumped up, they're ready to go back and make changes and be that strategic business partner. And then I may, might hear from them later saying, well, my boss just, you know, put up the walls. 
Yeah, he likes yeah. me just staying in this box. But yes, you're right. That's a, a whole separate webinar, right? Right. Um, but so, so here's two takeaways from that. Okay. Find one to two things this week that you find tedious or that you think could be done in a more efficient way and dedicate some time to restructuring those so that they're not tedious. They produce better results in less amount of time. I mean, everybody should take that and go and, and, and practically look for a couple of things they can transform into a much more fulfilling deal. So, Gosh, I'm loving this. I'm going to have to watch the replay of our webinar because I'm taking notes as you're talking. I love it. I just love, you know. Let's just turn it into a book, Joan, a co-written book. I know. I love it. I get so inspired by listening to you. Um, and we're so much on the same page, which is exciting. Uh, the, the, the next one is very important. Avoid perpetual burnout. I mean, a lot of assistants feel burnt out. And, and the other thing today, Darren, um, you know, as you know, and are probably aware for the past several years, assistants are, are uh, supporting two to 60 people in a, a department. It's just crazy today. So how do they avoid perpetual burnout? Yeah, gone are the days, and I'm not sure how far away these days were, but one executive, one assistant, right? That that's very rare. And 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 burnout comes into this this, you know, we talk a lot about work life balance and and so forth. I think the real issue is that for many people, their life is their play, that's the fun, that's what they do, and their work is drudgery. So they walk in the front door and they're just like, oh, geez, okay. And they can get through the eight hours. Then we live for, thank God it's Friday, you know, and, and, and now I've got the weekend that I can recover so I can actually uh, get something done. So I, I think that, um, you know, we're living in a world where we've got to make work and play kind of come together. In fact, uh, Jeff Bridges uh, calls it uh, uh, plorking, I believe. Instead of working, he calls it play and working. And who doesn't? <laughs> Jeff, who doesn't love Jeff Bridges? Uh, yeah. <laughs> somebody asked me. I, I had to answer a, a, some blog questions recently, and somebody said, uh, "You know, who if you were there was ever a movie you made about you, which is not going to happen, but who would you want to play?" I said, "Jeff Bridges, of course." <laughs> but so so li listen to this. Do you tell me what this this uh, line is from? Whistle while you work. Where is who can who did that? Oh come from? yeah, that's uh, the Disney movie, isn't yeah. it? The so, Disney. What is seven that? dwarves. Okay. Yeah, seven dwarves. I, I've got a test for everybody listening now. So listen to this. Okay. Who knows this reference? I'm going to read some song lyrics. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. You find the fun and snap the jobs a game. Second line. And every task you undertake becomes a piece of cake, a lark, a spree. It's very clear to see that dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Just a spoonful of sugar. Oh, make they're getting it. Look, look at, at all, that. Look at yeah, look, look at, at the I, chat. Okay. Uh, seriously, Sarah, Veronica, Karen, Rebecca, did y'all Google that that fast? <laughs> or do you really remember that song? So we've got Disney movies teaching us years ago that work is supposed to be fun. And anybody who tells you it's not, I, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, years ago, Henry Ford, and you know, I talk about this a lot, but Henry Ford had a no jocularity, no laughing, no uh, having fun at work policy. It's ridiculous. You know, Southwest says nobody goes, uh, nobody has a good, uh, is successful unless they enjoy what they're doing, right? Unless they're enjoying it. So burnout comes about largely because we are not either bringing our best to the work or that work has become such drudgery. So. You know, let me let me ask you, is this work or fun? Digging a ditch. Is digging a ditch work or fun? Well, it depends on whether you're asking, you know, some four, uh, you know, four, eight year old boys and girls who are out, you know, with a shovel having a great time digging a ditch. You know, yeah. uh, is washing dishes fun or not fun? S to some people, it's pure judgery. To other people, it's it's a blast. Uh, public speaking. You know, there are people right now watching this that would have a heart attack if they had to get up in front of a group and other people flourish in it. So it's, it's the, the burnout is not just a function of the work we're doing. It's about who we are when we're doing it. Mm, and that. That, that we're just, you know, work, work, work without any kind of element of play. 
a filing can be fun if you're racing the other person, you know, a colleague to see who can get the most amount, you know, the gamification of work. So I do believe that we're moving into a, a, a day and time where people are just going to move away from jobs that are considered to be uh, really boring and that they're going to look to find their own meaning in them as people have done down through history. Mm -hmm. I like, uh, I love what you just said. And, and I was just thinking about for us as speakers, you know, um, and if we've given a presentation over and over, okay, so for 26 years, I've been talking to assistants about eggs and attitudes. Right. I think I would be sick of eggs and attitudes, right? And I keep getting up and I keep teaching it. But as you said, it's how I approach it. It's how I look at it and think, okay, but this is a new audience. And how can I add a spin to it? And what can I do different to keep it exciting? I mean, 26 years you speak on something. So for us, correct, and that's, again, where I agree with you 100%. I love that thought um, because I'll share with assistants. It's, it's adding, adding creativity to your work. I mean, yes, after a while, the things you do as an assistant become ho-hum, the same meeting, the same reports, setting up the same staff meetings. But it, it's what we can bring to that, right? And making it fun and making it interesting. I, I walked into a 7-Eleven in Austin, Texas. Uh, my youngest is at University of Texas. Go, woohoo! <laughs> uh, I think that's the right side. <laughs> and, uh, so at, I walk into the 7-Eleven and this guy is just the most alive, energetic. He's working at a 7-Eleven behind the counter. But he brings his A game to that experience. And guess what? People feed off his energy and he feeds off the energy of other people. I, I actually went back out to the car and got him a book, a company of owners. I brought it back in. I said, dude, you are living exactly what I talk about in this book. Uh, so it's really not about the job. It's it's about what you're bringing to it. And I see some people chiming in uh, with yeah. that. As well. Hook yeah. them <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, let's see. I, uh, I could talk about each one of these for a great deal of time, but we will get on to the fourth one. Enlighten up by creating space in your day. OK, so how many times have you been just in a slow moment and you're deep in thought and you're kind of gazing off somewhere and then somebody walks in the office and you immediately go on full alert like, oh, no, I'm doing something. You know, da, 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 you start whatever it is. We've all done that. <laughs> Science is indicating and showing that when people have moments of rest interspersed with work, they perform at a much higher level. Mm -hmm. Air traffic controllers who were given a 45 minute, 60 minute nap at a certain part in the day outperform their colleagues and peers on the stuff we want them to be really good at, at, you know, recognizing problems and being able to, uh, uh, you know, deal with complex solutions. It, they, they've done some MRI studies. When do you think your brain is most active? When you are solving a calculus problem or when you are daydreaming? When do you think? They can see this on an MRI, how much of brain firing is going on. Okay, everyone out there, uh, what do you think? Solving a math problem, a calculus problem, let's make it a really hard math problem, uh, or daydreaming. daydreaming. Which do you wow. think is a bigger daydream, 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 daydream? Yes, absolutely. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. How many times have you gone to bed at night? Complex problem you're trying to solve. You can't get it solved. You wake up the next day and all of a sudden, boom, solution right there. Yes, I should break up with the dude. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that was just a little levity thrown in there. No, you, you, you have this thing you're trying to solve. They actually did a study where they took 80 people they showed them um, the details on like five different cars or something and gave them all the stats on them and said, now we want you to rate these in a little bit on the, on which one you think is top rated, et cetera. Mm -hmm. for, they did that for four minutes. Look at this data. Half the group, they then split off and had them look at some pictures or something creative, some art, something. The other half of the group, they got to look at the data for four more minutes when they evaluated the results, when they, when they, uh, you know, ranked the cars, the group that, that looked at something different that didn't spend eight minutes on the assignment actually outperformed the group that had more time. Mm -hmm. Why? 
because our brains are wired in such a way that it is in those you know kind of rest periods where the cre that there's there's a something that go, goes goes to work in our brains it's called the default mode network the dmn so if you ever get caught sleeping at your desk, just say, I'm, I'm in my DMN mode. Default mode. Oh, don't let Brian hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you know what, what they've shown is that when people really take vacations, legitimate vacations, uh -huh. they come back, they perform better. When people have rest periods during the day, you know, we, we, you know, we joke somewhat about siestas and all that, but there may be some real value to that. Um, you know, I was, uh, I, I was interviewed by a guy in Houston, real curmudgeonly guy recently, and he was talking about the fact that some of the universities were having kids play with Play-Doh and, you know, do origami, watch movies before their finals. Wow. He said, this is ridiculous. You know, what if this tries to make its way into the workplace and everything? And I, I had to tell him, I said, listen, the science really supports that. They, if they've studied appropriately and then they'll take some downtime and break, they're going to perform better on the test. And we've gotten out of that. You know, we're, we're all work and no play. And that's the way we think about it. And, you know, it, 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 it's just we got to take some time. This is why people who meditate, people who take naps, people who do, et cetera, have some downtime, tend to outperform people who don't. Mm -hmm. And I love the word you said is take, because if we wait for someone to give us that time or permission during the day, well, no one's going to do it. No one's going to come up to an assistant and say, Hey, why don't you go chill for five minutes? You know, <laughs> instead they're coming at them with everything, and so they have to have the courage, right? To, to just, you know, how can they take that, um, make that space for themselves? Yeah, and I, I'm talking to the wrong audience here because, uh, again, this is a different group that needs to make this happen. But what if they did walk in and say? Hey, you know, I want to talk a bit. Let's brainstorm a little bit about this this uh, thing, this retreat, this meeting we have coming up. Why don't we get out of the office? Let's go walk around the block. Let's mm -hmm. let's take a. Or what if a, a, a manager came in and said, "Guess what, guys? We're knocking off at two o'clock today. Uh, we're all going to go to the movies. And when we get done with the movies, we're going to go have a drink. Uh, you know, not cutting into personal time, by the way. Right. During work, we're going to go have some, you know, drink a beer and talk about what did you learn from the movie and what do you think we mm -hmm. could learn from it as a company? I mean, there's all sorts of ways to build creativity in. Right. Unfortunately, most people are just so busy, right? Doing the quote work that we miss that stuff. And consequently, I think we leave a lot of ideas on the table. This is, you know, Google used to do the the hardwired 20% time that you had during your week uh, or, or during your month to go do something that was not Google related. And they said that 50% of the ideas that they had at Google came from that non Google time from somebody wow. going to a cooking class or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, going and studying the migratory practices of locusts or something. I made that one up. I don't know. <laughs> it, it is possible though. Um, what it really takes, what I'm hearing and seeing and believe in is we have to shift our thinking. That That's the big thing, right? Like if I come in and just feel that I have no control and that I have to constantly be at the beck and call of everyone and everything, then that's how I'll operate. But as an assistant, like I think when I was an assistant for 20 years, um, is, is you have to just, even if you're sitting at your desk, it's just, being quiet in your mind for five minutes and not mm. being afraid to do that or get up and, and just walk around, you know, take that five minutes. I always tell women, go into the ladies room, go in a stall and be quiet for five minutes. Nobody's going to catch you. there. Yeah. It's just, it's about one. I think we've got to shift our thinking, you know, take which is a lot of what you're talking about. Instead of seeing it this way, you've got to see it this way. And then we have to have the courage to not follow the crowd. Oh, big, big. Because the crowd is not leading to a very good place in 2017. Um, we are moving into a place where creativity, individuality, um, you know, crowds do crowd kind of work. Mm -hmm. And nobody listening to this wants to just be a part of the crowd. Uh, they want to perform at a different level. And I, I actually think the future of work is exciting, but a lot of jobs that are very just rote and mundane, if this, then that, those jobs are going away. 
So the real value moving into the future is people who are able to deal with people. So I stress that so much. People are really have great uh, EQ, you know, emotional mm -hmm. uh, uh, intelligence and people who are using their right brain to create and to come up with new ideas and new things because everything that's just purely process oriented, computers are starting to do that. And we see that at a pretty alarming rate. I'm talking to a group this week uh, in an industry that is so far behind the times on that. And they are about to get blown out of the water if they don't recognize that, you know, technology is taking over their industry. It used to be a very personal, very, you know, this is my mm -hmm. person I deal with and so forth. No, it's all going online. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Don't follow the crowd. This is this is about finding finding your own path. And, and, and really, if you're not enjoying work, the, the the second or third thing you need to look at, maybe the 10th thing you need to look at is changing jobs. The first thing you need to look at is how am I doing my work and what could I do that would make it more enjoyable? What kind of a different attitude could I have or what? how could I approach my work differently uh, where I would, would would be feeling like I'm bringing much more my A game to it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, speaking of with technology, the next uh, number five I had, I flagged invest in technology. Um, if you're asking me to fax something to you, we have a problem, right? Uh, and I know I'm stepping on a lot of toes right now, but there's a little thing called DocuSign. There's all sorts of other avenues. So many companies are doing things. I had a friend who worked at a company where they would have her print out emails and then go file the emails. Okay, now think of the insanity of that. You can digitally mm -hmm. store this stuff. You can search it. There's all sorts of, but there's just a lot of craziness. And if you're at a company where they're not investing in technology for things that technology needs, that technology can fix, then you're really behind the times. And I, I, that's one of my indicators of a beast well company is when you scrimp on technology. And I don't care, quite frankly, what kind of company it is. It could be a ditch digging company. If you're not using technology to make that even that process sort of more efficient and scheduling and so on and so forth you know so the stuff that that companies are asking to do on note cards and you know sticky notes and things like that sticky notes have their place obviously but i mean i i i think we need to invest in technology because technology is the future and technology is here to help us it's here to take a lot of the busy work out that we don't have to do the processing mm -hmm. um you know i mean who wants to fold clothes, right? Uh, if we've got a machine that can do that, let's do it. Somebody earlier posted, I hate washing dishes, you know. <laughs> so that's, we came up with dishwashers. We've got things. Right. Work is is the next big revolution where technology is going to solve a lot of that. But uh, so many companies are skimping on technology when they need to be uh, ramping it up, not not pulling. Oh, okay. I, Sorry, I was on. I was with a company recently. Metro. I've talked to them. Customer service, which you know, that's a problem. If I've had to talk to customer service more than once, then we have a problem. <laughs> but a fair amount, and I consistently hear on the other end. And this is a communication company, a phone communication company. Oh. And I consistently hear on the other end. I'm sorry, our service is slow. Somebody is falling down at that company. They, customer service, their primary mm -hmm. tool is this thing we're doing right here. This should be the they should have the fastest technology the best machines the quickest response time because that's standing in the way of them doing their job okay excellent all right let's see i'm, I'm watching the time here because i see there's a lot of questions going on so we have three more so i'll move kind of quickly because i want to make sure we get to everyone's questions um i love the next one obliterate comfort zones Let's take this on a much more personal level than work. Okay. People go to their grave with their the song still in them. I can't remember who said that, but it's a, it's a famous quote. And uh, Seth Godin points out, and I, th I think he's really right on this, that the, the, your comfort zone is not the safety zone. I'm afraid to fly. Well, the reality is flying is one of the safest modes of transportation you can take. I'm afraid to get up in front and speak to people uh, in an audience. Well, last I've heard, nobody has died from public speaking ever in the history of ever, maybe one or two people. There has to be somebody who's died from it, okay? But the numbers are really slim. Uh, 
So all of these things that people stay in and they do, I don't want to write my book. Um, you know, Joan, I don't know what it was like for you when you wrote your first book, but at some point you had to say, doggone, I'm just going to do this. You had to get out of that comfort zone. And so, so many people are living in their comfort zone and they think it's the safety zone. The safety zone is huge. The stuff that you think is not safe because it doesn't feel good or it doesn't feel right is typically not only safe, but it would advance you in some phenomenal ways. And I, I just think for all of us, we, we've got to start saying yes to things that we would have never said yes to. Um, I, I probably should put a little disclaimer on that. <laughs> I can, Joan, I can see some people, you know, sending me these. Well, yeah. you know, so, yes, no, <laughs> right, that's not that. but you know what I mean. The the, the normal yeah. kind of activities that that get in our way, obliterate, get rid of those comfort zones, and and go live. I mean, most people regret more the things they didn't do than the things they did, and that's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's that's it's worth saying over and over and over again, and I don't think. I don't think a person truly understands it until they've been very close to what I experienced in 2014 with my brain surgery and very close to death and being very sick. And in 2015, I had open heart surgery. Hmm. And, and I would hate for people to have to go through such traumatic events to realize life is so precious. And every single day we need to live it and not be afraid, um, you know? And so that's my two cents. I love um, it. And right. that's from real experience, Joan. Thank you for that. Beautiful. Uh, all right. Two more. We had, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> we reward busyness. We reward busy work. It's ridiculous. And Sometimes, you know, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, that creative zone we can get into. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to sit there and just drift off a little bit. Sometimes you need to walk away from the desk, get away from the problem, uh, you know, go veg for a little bit. You'll be amazed, especially if you set that intention of, OK, unconscious, you go to work on this. I'm going to go have a snack and walk around the block a little bit and get some fresh air. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, we really emphasize doing, 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 and we are human beings, not human doings. You've heard this, but you know, we, we, we just need to spend a little more time being and, uh, and standing there instead of just running around like chickens with our head, heads cut off. Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. Um, and the number eight's really close to what we've already been talking to. So I want to get to the questions. The eighth one I have is eliminate trivial activity, which I think you've now shared with us in a lot of different ways and hopefully everyone's gotten the point of that. Yeah. Um, so, so everyone who's on the webinar, we are going to go to Q and A in just one second, but I also want to encourage you to please stay on to the very end because we do have a, an exciting announcement to make um, in reference to Darren and such. And uh, just, Anyways, let's turn this over because I think there were a lot of questions. And Malia, I'm going to let you handle the question portion and present those to Darren. Hi. Hey. Hi, Darren. How are you? Hey, I'm great, Malia. Hey, I think you um, have the makings for a new webinar with your singing songs and getting people to guess because the <laughs> audience really I, loved that. I apologize for the singing. <laughs> I think you should make that into your own little webinar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I have some questions for you. Kayleen is asking, how do you deal with broken processes in large companies that absolutely kill your pro productivity? Excuse me. Oh my goodness. Those drive me crazy. Processes, I call that friction and anything that creates friction, broken processes and broken equipment, there is no excuse for. I was at a company recently and a guy made the comment, he said, well, if they expect for all the equipment, this is a big manufacturing type, you know, refining type place. He said, well, if they expect all the equipment to work all the time, that's just unreasonable. I said, okay, cool. How many appliances at home is it okay for that appliance to be out for six months? Mm. If your air conditioning's <laughs> out, your plumbing's out, you know, you've got to, you, the stove is out. No, that's going to be unacceptable. We would never, but somehow in the workplace, it's okay. Well, just, you just need to muscle up and deal with it. No. Companies at a bare minimum need to have efficient processes. Uh, I've got I've got a I've got a diagram and whiteboard. I can't I can't find it right now, but it 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 says which process is yours, and it shows all of these zigzagging and moving around and all this stuff. 
versus just a square box, move here, 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 and here. That's what processes should look like. That's why companies like Toyota and Honda really ruled the automotive uh, world back in the day because they shifted their processes and they started coming out with, with whole different things. Edward Dimmings, don't get me started, but uh, fix the process and you'll be amazed at how productivity goes up and engagement goes up. People get worn out with, uh, with, you know, broken processes. So yeah. I'm, I, I don't know that that's just how to fix them other than say fix them, but I'm with you. If, if, if your company has broken processes and, and, and broken equipment, that's bad on them. Yes, and um, Robin's question is kind of along the same lines. Uh, she is asked, she's saying, what do you do when you've created new processes and procedures and you've tried to educate people on them and they just don't want to learn anything new? Yeah, oh boy, I'm smiling because that's <laughs> not the first time I've encountered that. And so it, 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 it does take some change management. It takes some communication. So I was at a company where they were implementing a new software program that was going to be phenomenal and save a lot of steps and do a lot of things. But people, for example, were really comfortable with Excel. And what I and so let's take Excel and SAP. And I know SAP's, you know, good word, bad word, just fill in the book, whatever you want to call it. But the point was that when someone's got a PhD in the tool that they're currently using and they have to go back to being a kindergartner in the new tool, even if the new tool is better. It's just hard for them to do. And so some of that is change management. And some of that is, hey, you know, you've got to bring people to, to the show. you got to hire people who are always wanting to progress. Continuous improvement. So many companies have that on their list. So, so few people, uh, you know, exercise that. But you try to lead them along. You show them the benefits. You help. You have to train them. If you don't train them, then it is hard for them to use the new tool. And at after doing all that, if they just refuse to shift, then you got to start seeing that as a roadblock and, and deal with it in a different way. Great. Um, Judith is asking, what happens when you're willing to make changes, but your boss is distracted, disorganized, and can't settle down long enough for you to even, to even listen to your options? So how would you handle a boss like that? Just the only thing I can say is the, you know, everybody's busy, but the more of the work you can do on the front end, the better. I think, uh, I, I think it's in company of owners. I talk about this, that bring a solution, not a suggestion or an idea. When you come and say, Hey, I think it'd be really cool. If then you're handing somebody a lot of the work, right? But when you say, I've studied this for three months, here's how much money we're wasting. Here's exactly how much money we could be saving. I've already contacted three vendors. Here's what the cost would be to make this shift. And I recommend vendor A, and this is the implementation time. And I've got some people waiting on hold that could do this in less than 48 hours if, if we're willing to move forward. So, you know, bring, I don't just bring ideas, bring uh, actual solutions if you can. And you might find that you get a lot more attention. That, that also, by the way, is the best way to advance in your career because uh, I heard a great story the other day about a guy that worked at Frito-Lay that came up with uh, the uh, the flaming Hot Cheetos. And he came up with this from, you know, a, a couple of different, but this guy was like a janitor. He worked as a janitor at Frito-Lay. He's now the, the executive vice president of something because he came with an idea and a solution, a way to do it. He didn't just say, wouldn't it be cool if we had hot Cheetos? He actually created them, made them, came in and had people sample them got in front of the right people. So yeah, come with a, come with a plan, not just an idea. Wow, that's pretty, that's a great story. Um, okay, Nita wants to know, how do you, how to have work and life balance when your managers work 24 seven and they expect you to be available all the time? Yeah, your managers have an illness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we gotta get out of this habit of, you know, expecting there are very very few five percent maybe of jobs in the world where i'm sorry but you just have to be on call a lot right and most people know that going in 98 percent of the folks listening to this including me that's not at that an emergency level i've got to have this i've got to be able to get a hold of you at 10 o'clock on a, on a on a saturday night and that's a conditioning thing and i think that's a conversation thing where you have to say hey listen 
I work really hard these periods. And if there's ever an emergency, I will take care of this in a heartbeat. However, can we talk some about the downtime? Because what I find is when I have some time that I can do some of these other activities, man, I come back to work refreshed and I come up with so many more, you know, great ideas. I work harder, I work better. You know, if you can have that kind of conversation, but we do, we do have an epidemic out there of managers who think busy is what they're being rewarded for. And if you want to wait 10 years, you want to wait 20 years, that's going away. Uh, they'll find out very quickly that that's not the way to operate. But in the meantime, you, you really either have to have a conversation or you have to train them by what you respond to and don't respond to. Okay. Uh, Diane would like to know what would you say is the single most important element of um, amping up performance? Wow. Uh, so the <laughs> single best thing I think, uh, and I wrote a book about it is act like an owner, get out of order taking mode and treat yourself in a company as an invaluable part of that company. That I don't care what level you're at. You have to see yourself that there are no levels. Okay. Companies will embrace and go, go with anything that ultimately makes the company better, makes it, you know, more profitable. And when you come to work with the mindset of this is my place, uh, I own it. I take responsibility for it. Um, you know, responsibility is another big one. We need to all stop all of that. Well, I would have, could have, should have. I didn't because it was so-and-so's fault. They didn't get this to me in time. But just say, hey, buck stops here. I'm going to take care of it. When you become a kind of person that's really dependable on what you say you're going to do, doing what you say you're going to do, and then doing it, I think that separates you from the pack. But it's really just, it's summarizing that idea of act like an owner. Act like you think the owner would act with the company's money. You know, all it applies to all areas because, you know, if this was my money, would I spend it? No. If this was my company, would I hire this person? No. Well, then why should the company hire them? Or why should they put up with this behavior, et cetera? Exactly. Um, Shelly is asking, how would you approach your executive to incorporate some of the ideas that we discussed today? Ooh, okay. So similar things. I think you have to, you have to bring, um, I know. Okay. For starters, everything I am going to say on here and I'm not watching the feed. I want to be watching it so bad because there's so many great comments. And, yeah. and But you know, there's an old saying that we have that it's easier said than done. Everything I'm going to say today is easier said than done. Uh, you know, Hey, let's go build a skyscraper is easier said than done. So the work is the tough part behind that. But it doesn't mean you don't have to start by saying it. The skyscraper doesn't get built unless you say, let's go build a skyscraper. That begins with that decision, right? So I think when you start to germinate with these ideas and, and start to demonstrate that, your manager starts seeing something different out of you, of your problem solving. You're not just doing busy work. You're energized on a on a Friday, not because it's Friday, but, but because you've had such a, a, a meaningful and powerful and beneficial week, they're going to start coming to you saying, hey, what's going on? Where did this come from? What's happening here? Um, and then outside of that, you know, give, give them some great resources. I always I say a company of owners is the book that the CEO picks up and puts on everybody's desk. I think Beast Whale is the one that uh, employees sneak into the C C-suite, leave <laughs> the desk and sneak back out like, hey, we have a problem here. So, you know, find find some ways to have that conversation. And if your heart is right, you're sincere, you're trying to make the company better, they'll listen to you ultimately. Yeah. And could I, I want to jump on to that a minute because um, if it were me, like I'm thinking, if I, when my days of being an assistant, um, I think a perfect segue is, is from this program that I would go into my, I would get my notes together of what I heard today. I would get the key points, the key elements together, mm. the solutions, the strategies. I would go in tomorrow when I have my daily huddle with my executive, which is something I would, I did all the time. And I would just refer to, I attended this wonderful webinar here. Who was, who here is, who was on the webinar. Here are the credentials of Dr. Darren Martin. And here's what I learned. And I would like to share these ideas with you and, and discuss how we could incorporate this into building a strategic partnership. And, and I think the thing we have to remember, especially for assistants, is that 
you do have to give your executives time to to digest information. I a lot of times for me now that I'm on the other side of the desk, my day is busy. But what I love to do is take information or ideas that have been presented to me. And when I'm on that four or five hour airplane ride, that's when I will digest and look and massage what someone has presented to me. Right, yeah. Darren? I mean, I'm sure you do that a lot. I love it. Yeah. In fact, I actually write a lot of books on plane. Plane rides are great because you're sort of a captive audience, right? But mm-hmm. I'm going to, and by the way, Malia and uh, Joan, I'm going to make an offer here. I hope I don't regret, but I'm seeing all these questions sort of pop up on the feed. And I know you guys are going to send those to me. And what I'm going to do is I'm not go, uh, thinking about, it. I'm going to do it. Okay. I'm going to take those and I'm going to give responses and then we can send that back out, right. To people who are making it available somehow through office dynamics. Yes. Uh, okay. So if people's specific questions aren't getting answered, then we'll be able to, to respond to those as well. I, I think that's a fabulous idea because I know we're, we're just getting close on time here. We are. Um, and I would love that because I've actually been jotting down a lot of the questions. I've been trying to watch them and I'm blown away by the caliber of questions that were being asked today. And Darren, it's almost making me feel like when you come to our conference this year, I don't know if we could at all have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of your session because- Love it. I'm overwhelmed with the volume of questions that are being asked. And again, the depth of the thinking of the question. Mm, I love um, it. So maybe we, we could add that in, um, which leads me to a couple things. Well, first of all, um, if everyone could stay on again, just a few more minutes, because I, I have an announcement about Darren and his uh, coming to our conference this year, which we're very excited about. But I, I wanna thank you again, Darren, for all your time. I, I love doing webinars with you. Um, you're just great and have so much knowledge and information. And I think you bring a value, an extra benefit or value because you work with the CEOs and executives and owners all the time. And you bring a, what I call the executive perspective, which is really important for assistants to know because if they wanna get on the same page and be considered part of the management team, they need to think like the executives that they support, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's just a rule of thumb period to be able to get in other people's shoes, you know, uh, and really see the world through their lens, I agree. So before everyone heads off, I want to be sure to let everyone know what our offer is today. And when Darren comes to our conference this year, his topic is performing at the speed of now. He's going to share with us how to work smarter, not harder to get better results. Who wouldn't love that? And also, um, Darren, I know you're going to be sharing both tools and the psychology and science of how to produce better results, which is very important. So we I wanted to feel super generous today because I want people to be able to come and hear you and see you and, you know, get your book autographed and such. Um, So here here's what we're going to do today. So if anyone registers for our conference by May 31st, they're going to get $100 off their registration, um, and they're going to get a copy of Darren's book, The Beached Whale Book that we talked about today. You'll get that at conference, so Darren could personally sign it and give it to you. And you'll also get conference on demand, so you could see all the replays and all the wonderful speakers we're going to have. So our code for that is AMP100, so AMP100. And I want to make it extra special. If anyone or signs up by the end of Wednesday night, May 17th, by midnight, we're going to give you $200 off conference. You'll get all the other goodies. And Darren even wants to give you an extra, his other book, The Sink, which is another amazing, interesting title. So we're sweetening the deal because I want you to be able to come. Um, We're going to have Darren and many other amazing speakers. So thank you, Darren, so much for your time again and just your your sharing and your caring. Um, And I want to thank all the people who attended our webinar today. Thank you for making the time to be with us. We just love being with you. 
Um, so Darren, thank you so much. Jo Joan, being with you at the conference and on the webinar last year was one of my absolute favorite things last year. I'm so excited we're, we're, we're doing that. Thank you. Yes. And we're going to have fun again. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye.